This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 911, recorded on June 17th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 81 degrees, which is just short of being our nice palindrome. That's 81 Fahrenheit, so it's 27 Celsius. Wow, we're at 31 Celsius today. Wow, pretty warm. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. 97. Uh, <laughs> and... Sunny, according to what's outside the window. Uh, and uh, let's see here. For the next two weeks, all but one day is in excess of 100 degrees. Wow. 101, wow. 104, 103. And we have uh, had, uh, I haven't taken uh, the score today, but so far on the order of, I think, 10 days or 12 days in excess of 100 degrees in June. So this is um, uh, record-breaking, actually. So, but, you know, it's okay. So it, when they say that, does it usually, is it usually right it's going to be over 100 for the next X days? Close enough, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, mm -hmm. they bet, you know, I mean, it's close enough to 100. You know, we're talking about between 104 and 100 and three mm -hmm. or 101 and 104 something like that so you know if they're off by a couple of degrees it can be 99 instead yeah, of 100 yeah. but it's uh it's pretty close it's hot and from madison new jersey brianne barker hi everybody um unsurprisingly it is also 31 celsius 88 fahrenheit here um which i thought was hot and now i'm just glad that i'm not in austin <laughs> It's so, like a convection oven outside, um, but you yeah. know, if you we we get out and walk early in the morning, I get out and garden early in the morning, mm. uh, and you you know you also get used to it. It's it's the the humidity's not bad, so we're okay. Let me see what is the humidity um, hmm, today. Um, okay, Doug, you have to fast forward another fifteen seconds. Yeah, the humidity is the humidity is thirty eight degrees, uh, thirty eight percent. So that's so, not bad. So here inside the incubator, I can't control the temperature. It is freezing. They have it at sixty eight. My God, who is doing sixty eight anymore? Not me. <laughs> I mean, I, I have the thing set at seventy four, I think, and it's it's sixty eight. It doesn't. So whatever I set it to doesn't work. I have to complain because I'm freezing. Yeah, my office is always freezing. And it's just a waste of energy. I Can to you show try you guys hanging a, a, hang a wet paper towel over the thermostat? It fakes it out and it thinks it's Hey, I should try that. It's a good it idea. Yeah. I want to show you guys the YouTube thing award oh. we got. So you this got is the, the silver plaque that I got from YouTube last week for uh, passing 100,000. <laughs> it says, ah. presented to Microbe TV for passing 100,000 subscribers. Isn't that Excellent. Cool? Oh. Nice. That's so cool. That's, that's us. And um, it comes with a very nice letter from uh, the CEO who is um, Susan Wojcicki on really thick paper. Mm. <laughs> And you and like paper. <laughs> I know. It's such a nice sheet of paper. I'm really impressed, YouTube. And um, it's a lovely letter. Uh, do you remember your first subscriber, your hundredth or your thousandth? Chances are you do. And we know that you'll definitely remember your hundred thousandth. I don't remember anything. Who knows who subscribed? <laughs> 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 I mean, I know when I hit those marks, but... Uh, your fans may have found you while searching YouTube, learned about you through a friend, or maybe you showed up as a recommended video. No matter how they came, fans stayed, their numbers increased because of your unique voice and the excitement of being part of the growing community that you established. And and, and it goes on. Uh, so keep creating, keep building. We can't wait to see 
what you'll do next. And we're here to support you along the way. And who knows, when you reach your millionth subscriber, we may just write to you and ask, do you remember your 100,000 subscribers? It's <laughs> very nice. Um, so I was, we were talking about this on the live stream the other night. I said, I doubt we can reach a million because uh, it took so long to reach 100,000 and a pandemic really got us there. And someone said, you need cats. If you have cats, you'll reach a million. <laughs> and I said, well, Rich and Brienne have cats. Yeah, we, cats. yeah we, we can make <laughs> that happen. They, and, they, don't and Alan, they don't show up enough. I can, Alan, you know, and uh, Alan's got cats. And then someone said, Brienne, well, uh, since Brienne went back to her office, I don't see her cat anymore. <laughs> I, I, You know, I can go back to my apartment at, from time to time. <laughs> I don't think the cat's going to make a difference. but Probably not. I think 100,000 is a cool. We're actually at 110,000 now, so we're still moving. And uh, I think it's... It's cool that a sciencey program, a bunch of science podcasts, right, could could get such high numbers. So thanks thanks for watching and listening, everyone. We have a couple of things to talk about today. Any updates, Kathy? No PSAs or anything mm. like that? Mm. Oh, um, just that some people are still a little bit confused about the uh, vaccine requirement and how that's going to work. And if any of them are listening, then I'll explain it. <laughs> but we've, we've tried to spell it out in, in words uh, in various places on the website. But you can go now anytime and download the free clear app and upload your vaccine data there. Mm -hmm. 10 to 14 days before the meeting, the ASV office will get a meeting code that we will send out to everybody that's registered. And you'll connect that meeting code with what you have already uploaded in the Clear app, and that will give you something that then you'll show when you get to Madison. So, okay, two-step process, I and have you to can do one step do now. So, for yeah. ASM, you had to upload your 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 vaccine card, but they they were actually just checking them all. It seemed to mm. me, and then they gave you a, a this green thing on an app on the ASM app, which you could then use to get into the building, and then you could go register. And once you registered, then you were good. Right. It worked. It was fine. I All was right, afraid yeah. it wouldn't work. Clear yeah. app is what Clear. I need. Clear app. Mm -hmm. It's on the ASV website. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. That's good. I would not have known that until the last Well, minute. it's the, the specifically the meeting website. So yeah. uh, there's yeah. a thing that's called meeting resources, one of the drop downs, and you can go there. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, we have a first uh, an update I wanted to um, tell, because this just popped up uh, the other day in Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. Trends in acute hepatitis of unspecified etiology and adenovirus stool testing results in children, U.S. 2017 to 2022. This, of course, comes out of uh, CDC. And um, it, uh, remember, in this cluster of children with with hepatitis of uh, unknown etiology first came up in November 2021 at a single U.S. hospital. And then uh, in April of 2022, uh, the, uh, that cluster had been investigated and there were similar reports in Europe. The, the U.S. issued a health advisory saying, hey, if you see pediatric cases, uh, let us know. And since then, many of them have gotten positive adenovirus test results. Uh, many of them have been adenotype 41, which we talked about previously, typically causes gastroenteritis, but not recognized in healthy people as a cause of hepatitis, at least not in healthy children. And they say in this report, neither acute hepatitis of unknown etiology nor adeno 41 is reportable in the US, which makes it hard to look at what's going on there. And so they say, we don't know if this, these numbers have recently gone up or if they've been historically high. So that's what this little report is about. They took data from four different sources, administrative databases, basically, and went through it to look at trends in hepatitis-associated emergency department visits and hospitalizations, liver transplants, and adenovirus stool testing results among children in the U.S., and they uh, they looked at data from October 2021 to March 2022, and they compared it with a pre-COVID-19 
uh, pandemic baseline, right? Because that might have altered things. And the bottom line here is that they say the data do not suggest an increase in pediatric hepatitis or adenotypes 4041 above baseline levels. So, and they also say pediatric hepatitis is rare and the low weekly and monthly counts of associated outcomes limit the ability to interpret small changes in incidence. And they say, basically, we have to keep looking to see if anything's going on. Right. So, so is another way of putting this is that people started looking and so they found it more. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and so there isn't really any more than there was before. It's just, we're looking more, I think. Yeah. The, yeah, and I guess that's the idea. The numbers are low, so it's a little bit uncertain because of that, right? Yeah. Right. But Kathy, historically, there's no association of adenoviruses with hepatitis, right? I mean, the right. adenoviruses do uh, are associated with lots of different symptoms, but not hepatitis, right? Right. Right. I thought it was interesting the way that they um, set up the two time periods here. Um, so they have basically. Uh, the October 2021 to March 2022, and then sort of pre-2020 um, with the idea that 2020 to 2021 just has weird healthcare numbers in general. So they kind yeah. of <laughs> avoided that period. So anything that people might think about of that, um, they've gotten rid of by looking both at after this time period and before. Right. They also point out the discussion that the UK has observed increases in hepatitis among children one to four years old when comparing 2022 with previous years, but other European and non-European countries have not seen similar trends. I don't, so I don't know what, what's going on there. Yeah. And in fact, they phrase um, your point, Kathy, um, right after that really nicely of the um, the percentage did not a increase above pre-pandemic historical levels, although the total number of specimens submitted for testing has increased over time. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is happening that there's a certain amount of adenovirus 4041 and then a certain amount of hepatitis and sometimes they coincide, right? Uh, yeah, I don't even think that there's a correlation, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, know. there's no correlation. They're just both there, right? Yeah. In the summertime, uh, the, people eat ice cream. You know, it's yeah. <laughs> it, <laughs> the, the and the prevalence of uh, adeno forty forty or forty one is reasonably high. Uh, was yes. ten or fifteen percent? Is that right? So the probability that somebody coming in uh, with a problem is going to be positive for adeno forty or forty one is uh, uh, it's not unlikely. Okay. They, they had a they had a funny way. They had an interesting way of referring to the uh, referring to the exclusion of the COVID era mm -hmm. data. And I can't find it here right away. But they, you know, talked about how health seeking behavior was unusual during that time. Something like that. Mm -hmm. To finish my correlation causation thing, um, <laughs> ice cream people eat more. Uh, summertime people eat more ice cream. There are more drownings in summer, but there's no correlation between eating ice cream and drowning. Right. right. So it, the yeah, I always phrase that, and is that if you actually graph it, it looks like there would be a correlation, but it's right. in fact not because ice cream causes drowning or drowning makes people eat ice cream, um, but they both are related to the summer. Okay, so uh, if anything happens, we'll let you know, but nothing so far. I had uh, two, two additional thoughts about this. First of all, this is an, uh, essentially a negative result, yeah. but, needs, but needs to be published. We've talked about publishing negative results before, uh, and this is an important negative result that's published. Mm -hmm. My other mm -hmm. thought reading this was... Pediatric liver transplant just gives me the creeps as a parent. Mm. Mm. I can't yeah. imagine. Yeah. I mean, there's all sorts of awful things out there, but that would be one of them. Oh, and also that these are hepatitis of unknown etiology. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's amazing that in, uh, and I'm not faulting anybody here. I'm just uh, flipping out that in this day and age, you can have something like hepatitis and say, I don't know. I don't know what caused this. So, I mean, they're infectious agents, but then there are non-infectious agents sure. as well. And that's probably yeah. hard to, to yeah. seek, right? Yeah. Well, I didn't, you know, she, he or she didn't eat anything different. We haven't been anywhere <laughs> that I know of, <laughs> you know, so. Um, so maybe uh, some doc listening will write in and wax um, um, intelligently on hepatitis of unknown etiology. I'd like to hear what, what Harry Greenberg has to think about that. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. He probably has some thoughts probably or does. anybody else that works on livers. Okay. Uh, we have a snippet for you published in Cell Reports Medicine. And this is about Epstein-Barr virus. And I thought it would be an interesting follow-up to our discussion of the two papers linking uh, EBV with MS and a certain fraction of MS papers. And this is immunization with a self-assembling nanoparticle vaccine displaying EBV GHGL protects humanized mice against lethal viral challenge. Yeah, it, saying GHGL just it reminds me of a, a guy. I was doing a live stream virology course last fall, right? And all these people are listening. And I said, you carry out at one point, like within the first five minutes. And someone said, what's a you carry out? <laughs> like, oh, my God, this is going to be a long course. <laughs> <laughs> and he actually wrote me a letter. He was in the UK. And uh, he said, you know, I, I dropped out. But you should teach a course where you do really, really basic virology. And so uh, the GHGL just reminded me of that. Anyway, this is from uh, a variety of people from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, which is in Seattle, the University of Washington, a few other places uh, in Seattle and uh, so Harvard, it looks like. And the first author is Harmon Mali, and the last author is uh, Andrew McGuire. And um, so as, you, as we talked about not too long ago, Epstein-Barr virus, large DNA-containing herpes virus, infects many, many, most, if not most people on the planet. And um, it, it, has, it infects both B cells and epithelial cells. You may know it from mononucleosis, but it can also cause a variety of cancers. And he, they give numbers, which is very interesting. 265,000 new cases of cancer every year globally and 164,000 cancer deaths globally. Those are good numbers to know. Mm -hmm. And they, they, of course, talk all about all this because they say it would be really nice to have a vaccine. It could have a good global health impact. Um, the problem is that the virus uh, infects both B cells and epithelial cells in the oropharynx and infects them in different ways with different viral proteins and different cell receptors. So you have to any vaccine's got to block both, right? And right. And I think they also you know, make some points about um, whether the vaccine would have to prevent infection, um, which I know we spend a lot of time talking about preventing infection versus preventing disease. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think in this case, because um, this virus can establish a latent infection, um, preventing infection might be of particular importance more yeah. so than preventing disease because if we can yeah. if you get that um, latent infection long term even if you don't have symptoms you could potentially end up with some of these long term complications. Yeah, because virus will reactivate, reproduce, and yeah, right. same thing with HIV. Right, you need exactly. to really have a sterilizing vaccine, and that's going to be very tough. And so, uh, so they have you have to the virus infects epithelial cells and B cells, the, uh, the the virus has a variety of glycoproteins, as you heard in the title, uh, and uh, one receptor on B cells and a different one on epithelial cells. So uh, that's yeah. a challenge. Yeah. I, I had not appreciated this, and I made myself a grid as I was reading the introduction of epithelial cells and how the virus attaches and how 
uh, GB is activated, and then B cells and how the virus attaches, and then how glycoprotein B is activated. And that really helped sort it out for me because GHGL is common to both, but the attachment mechanism, and as you said, Vincent, that in different glycoproteins or different viral proteins involved in attachment uh, for the two cell types. But at least for the GB activation, they both, they both involve GHGL. Yeah. So then uh, they talk a little bit about neutralizing antibodies. Um, if you take serum from infected individuals, that serum can neutralize infection of B cells and epithelial cells in culture. And they say all of these viral proteins involved in entry, which include GB, uh, GHGL, and then another one called GP350, are um, targeted by these neutralizing antibodies. And they say that there have been efforts to make vaccines before, and most of them focus on GP350, uh, which to which some neutralizing antibodies are, are made, but they think it's not the whole story. Uh, these, these antibodies against GP350, which is a viral glycoprotein, block uh, the interaction with uh, the cell receptor, which for that is the complement receptor 1-2. Um, but these uh, antibodies against GP350 can't block infection of epithelial cells that don't have complement receptors. So if you take out the, the if the, the cells without complement receptors cannot can still be uh, infected and these antibodies don't do any good. So you're going to have to do better than that for, with a vaccine, obviously. Uh, and in fact, there has been a phase two trial of a GP350 vaccine. It did not protect against infection, I suppose. They say failed to protect against EBV. Um, I guess they're meaning infection, right? Despite decreasing the incidence of symptomatic uh, infectious mono by 78%. Yeah, so I, I took that as a difference between infection and disease. Yeah, yeah. So they said that uh, maybe we should put other proteins in there. And uh, what they're going to work on in this paper is GHGL, which apparently account for most serum antibodies that neutralize infection epithelial cells, but only a small fraction that neutralize infection of B cells. There is a... There's, there is an uh, previously described antibody called AMO1, AMMO1, which is against um, both GH and GL, apparently binds an, ep an epitope common to both that blocks infection of both epithelial cells and B cells. So that's an important epitope to hit if you're going to do a GH and GL vaccine. Um, and, and in fact... Uh, these antibodies have been used in some animal studies as a proof of concept that they can prevent infection. Okay, so with that background, they make a um, nanoparticle vaccine, multiple nanoparticle vaccines, uh, by taking the GHGL glycoproteins. They attach a multi multimerization domain to them. Is that what was done with uh, the Novavax? Did they attach a multimerization uh, domain? Uh, my understanding is that with Novavax, they didn't have to. It's, that, it's that, thing the that thing assembles uh, the the protein, the native protein, expressed as a, you know, as a monomer, self assembles yeah. okay. into a nanoparticle uh, without any other modification. Got it. Yeah, but I did read this that the previous vaccines, both with GP three hundred and fifty and with GHGL, were uh, perhaps monomers um, yeah. and one of the innovations here was this multimerization yes. that's right that's yes, right absolutely yeah so they can make they, they're going to compare monomers and multimers of different numbers of, of proteins as you will see and so they they produce these proteins with a um, they have a, a two different proteins that can cause multimers one of them is from helicobacter pylori ferritin <laughs> <laughs> or uh, a protein from fibrotin fold-on domain. And they attach them to that and they can get different constructs with, as they say, different valencies, sizes, and geometries. And then ask, how do they do in mice? 
in terms of eliciting antibodies and do they neutralize and protect against infection. And so they spend a lot of time describing uh, these proteins and showing that they can be produced in cells. They have they do electron microscopy to look at the particles. You know, they're sim- monodispersed, predicted sizes, and so forth. Um, but then they they look at binding. Um, the, well, first they characterize them by binding of several existing monoclonals to each nanoparticle. So they say, okay, epitopes are displayed in these nanoparticles. And then finally, they uh, immunize mice. And they immunize them with monomers 4, 7, 24, and 60 MERS. So they can get all those with adjuvant at different weeks. And then they collect serum uh, and they look at initially binding uh, of these to GHGL. Is it to GHGL? Yes, binding to GHGL by ELISA. And, you know, after one immunization, all the multimers do better than the monomer. Um, And if you boost, you get higher binding titers. And if you do uh, three, the monomer now elicits higher titers, but the multimers don't really uh, increase very much. I guess the monomer kind of catches up. Catches Catches up, up, yeah. yeah. I would agree. Catches up. So that's good because if you would like to immunize with as few doses as possible, right? So multimers make it easy for that. That's good. All right. So you make binding antibodies. What about neutralization? Uh, so they can look at infection of B cells and epithelial cells. They have cell lines that can do both. Um, and um, they they see neutralizing activity uh, against uh, epithelial cell infection. This after the first um, immunization with the multimers, and then uh, the second immunization boosts boosts the titers from ten to hundred fold in epithelial cells. Um, but interestingly, none of these antigens um, that could neutralize uh, none of these uh, antibodies could neutralize infection of B cells two weeks after the first immunization. After the second, they got some neutralizing titers, but not in all anim- but in, not in all animals done uh, immunized with the monomer. So you needed to have um, multiple doses to get in- neutralization in B cells. And, and then, the neutralizing um, titers against B cells are like a hundredfold lower than against yeah, they're epithelial lower. cells, consistent with what they've talked about in the introduction. Yeah. The third immunization did not further boost B cell neutralization, uh, but the monomeric did, and they had tenfold lower against uh, B cells. So their conclusion, uh, all the nanoparticles display superior immunogenicity compared with monomeric uh, GHGL after one or two immunizations, and a third did not result in a significant titer boost. So you can get both cell types uh, neutralizing antibodies for both cell types, which is good, right? That's what they wanted to do. Uh, they do some epitope mapping to see where these uh, antibodies are binding. And I, I don't think, I, I don't want to really go into that unless someone has a burn, burning <laughs> urge to do so. They no say burning urge. The, the conclusion is only a small, small portion of vaccine elicited antibodies in each group target this ammo epitope. Uh, they conserve the epitope, and they do not make a measurable contribution to neutralizing activity. So MO is the epitope that's on both proteins, GHGL, which could neutralize, give rise to neutralizing antibodies for both B cells and epithelial cells. My, my understanding was that that MO epitope is uh, comprises both GH and GL, that it was yeah. a complex epitope with yep. non-contiguous sequences out of both. You need both. That's right. 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 But the, the idea is that there are plenty of other epitopes right. that um, are part of this as well. The, the other bottom line I got out of these competition experiments and a lot of other discussion about these uh, antibodies was that on a nanoparticle that's anchored by the C terminus or mm-hmm. one terminus, 
the antibodies that are elicited that work best are distal to the multimerization site, which you know, conceptually makes sense. Right. All right, and then they do a challenge experiment in mice, and boy, they have to go through some hoops to do this, and sadly, yeah. because uh, apparently mice, mouse B cells can't be infected by EBV, so you have to make uh, mice with human B cells. So they take immunocompromised mice and give them hemato human hematopoietic stem cells so they can make B cells that can be infected by EBV, All right? But the problem is you can't immunize them because um, I, I don't know why. They say we can't immunize them. We have to actually give them antibody well, passively. Be, what was the reason? Because you're giving them B cells that are already developed. That's right. Yeah. The, and the B cells and the T cells, because the T cells are still mouse T cells, um, the mouse talking. T cells and the human B cells can't talk to each other. Yeah, so by giving them a, this, this cell that can be infected, you've taken away their ability to make antibodies, right? Yeah. They do not efficiently generate antibody responses. So they have to passively transfer purified antibodies. Um, so they say that um, at 20 weeks after this transplant of the human hematopoietic stem cells, 10 to 25% of peripheral blood mononuclear cells are human cells. So, you still have, don't just, oh, they're immunocompromised to begin with, so they don't have B cells of their own, right? Right. They're, they're immunocompromised, so they're RAG1 deficient and yeah. IL-2 um, receptor gamma chain deficient. Um, so, they, they don't have B cells or at least non-functional B cells, um, right. nor okay. do they have many T cells of their own. Okay. So, even if you didn't even infect them, if you just tried to immunize them, it wouldn't work because no. of that, right? Yeah. Okay. And then... As you say, the human B cells can't talk to the mouse T cells, so which there really aren't any mouse T cells, or relatively few, but the few that there are. No, that's talk right to because the they they're rags. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so hang on, I need a little clarification here because I I <laughs> stumbled on this as well. Okay. So the the mice that are immunized are a different background than the mice that receive yeah. the transfer. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so the okay. mice that receive the transfer are immunocompromised uh, mice. Right. So that you can put human B cells into them, and they okay. won't reject those human B cells. Okay. Um, so you have to use immunocompromised mice, and the reason that you have to use the human B cells is because EBV is a human tropic virus. Right. Okay. So you put in the human cells that are going to allow you to infect those cells, um, but the downside is you can't make an immune response because you had to use immunocompetent mice who wouldn't reject the cells you put in. Okay. Got it. And then you have to make enough antibody to passively give to those mice. And for that, you use wild type C57 black six mice. So they take 20 of them and immunize them and then bleed them and purify IgG from the serum. And then they give that to the humanized mice. They give IP, intraperitoneal injection, two days before challenge uh, with virus. Okay, you give IgG, then two days later you give them, you, know, you challenge them with Epstein-Barr virus, retroorbital injection mm -hmm. with 33,000 Raji infectious units. A Raji is a kind of cell. It's a yes. B cell, right? Yes, it is. That's a new one, a Raji infectious unit. <laughs> Good way of titrating your virus. Uh, and then they see what happens to the mice. They they weigh them three times a week. They monitor it for the general health over the course of 10 weeks. They collect blood. And then after they're finished, they take out their spleens. Uh, and at the end of this study, 100% of the animals in the uninfected control and the 60 MER treatment groups survived. So those are mice that received antibodies from mice that were immunized with the 60 mer. Okay, uninfected control. Yeah, that's good. 60 mer all survived. And in contrast, 100% of animals in the infected control, that means they got no antibody, and control IgG treatment groups died. So a control IgG against 
something else, not G G H G L. They all died by 56 and 66 days uh, after challenge. It's very interesting, right? That they, I mean, presumably, I guess the virus is simply reproducing in the B, in the human B cells in these mice, right? Right. Yeah, that was the part that I was a little uncertain about is exactly how the pathology was happening in this case. Yeah. Um, I did find it interesting that in the mice that got antibodies from the monomer immunized uh, mice, so they have the six those that got 60-mer vaccine yeah. and those that got monomer. Monomer, yeah. Uh, the monomer um, mice um, did worse than those 60-mer um, yeah, they they're not quite as bad as the infected control or the control IgG. Yeah, um, but the majority of those mice died. Yeah, um, and those that got the 60 mer uh, were protected. So I thought that that was a, a pretty interesting result in terms of yeah. this um, meltimerization technique. I don't understand why they died. Basically, right? No, they, and they didn't explain it. I was either. wondering what their symptomology yeah. was. It's probably published somewhere else. Um, because. It's not reproducing in the mouse epithelial cells, I presume, right? Because it's a human virus. And right. these are rag, they don't even have B cells. So if you kill the B cells that you gave them, I don't know why that would make a difference. But anyway, obviously it does. They die. But the, the point is that the vaccine protects them. Um, D, they look for uh, viral DNA. 100% of mice in the control tr treatment group and 100% of mice in the infected control group were viremic by 21 days after challenge. In the monomer IgG group, the viral DNA was found in the blood of 100% of mice. In 60-mer group, DNA was undetectable in 40% of mice at any point tested, but 60% did have DNA in them. So this is not a sterilizing vaccine, right? Right, but it's certainly uh, closer. Yeah, it's it's not bad. Um, and they they actually say it later. They say this is not a sterilizing vaccine. I'm glad they said that. Um, and so they say uh, there's a decline in peripheral B cells and an increase in CD8 positive T cells in the control mice and mice that have. Uh, monomer IgG, about a month challenge. And they say this is consistent with high-dose challenge and T-cell-mediated killing of infected B-cells. But I th don't they have very few T-cells? Uh, they they should have relatively few. It's not going to be perfect because these are RAG1 deficient and not RAG2 deficient. Yeah. Um, so it won't be 100%, but it will certainly be a decent uh, decrease in T-cells. And they looked at the spleens after the, the mice died and um, the, uh, the animals in the infected controlled group were significantly heavier. The spleens were heavier than those in the uninfected control. They had visible splenic tumors. I guess they should actually also have some human T-cells because they did put in human CD34 positive yeah, hematopoietic okay, yeah. stem cells. So they yeah, should yeah, get yeah. some human T-cells as well. Okay. And those would kill the human B cells only, and right? Not the, the epithelial cells, right? Uh, they could maybe kill either because they had to develop through the mouse thymus. Okay, got it. Um, let's see. Yeah, this means from two of the mice, in the viremic mice in the 60 mer group were heavier. So if you had viremia, you had, had tumors as well. Um, so basically... Um, the, the, the conclusion is multivalent display of GHGL elicits higher titers of neutralizing antibodies that protect against lethal challenge in a humanized mouse model, but they do not confer sterilizing immunity. So, um, so do you think that you were saying earlier, Brienne, and, and this is that was correct, you need to have sterilizing probably, uh, so that this can't go into further development until they can get it to be sterilizing, I guess, right? Right. I think that if looking at figure five um, and the QPCR data, it, they certainly have a big improvement mm. um, in moving towards it being sterilizing. There's a lot less DNA. 
right. um, in the mice that have been vaccinated with this. And so perhaps adding additional antigens um, could get them uh, further. But I would agree that they really need to get this to be sterilizing. I have a feeling, though, they're going to they make a statement in the discussion. They say gaining a better understanding of the epitopes on GL. GH that are targeted by neutralizing and non-neutralizing antibodies needs to be done. So uh, maybe they need to do more basic science before they make more uh, vaccine candidates. I think that makes perfect sense. Yeah. I have several comments. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I have to say that I really fell down a rabbit hole here with the biochemistry. <laughs> it's It's not, I mean, it's not, without any intention of um, diminishing the results. It's not like it's just really uh, incredibly complex biochemistry. It's, uh, in particular, in the way it's presented, it's pretty straightforward, but it's beautiful, okay? these The EMs of the multimerization guys, mm -hmm. they say we made one that ought to be a former, and you look at the EMs and there's this little circle with four spokes on it okay mm -hmm. seven mer same thing the 24 mer and the 60 mer they're they're just gorgeous and they're so mm -hmm. homogeneous uh, yeah. and of course they and they they run them i i i have to do this they run them on uh gel filtration columns size mm -hmm. inclusion columns um for the novices out there these are columns that are made up of uh agaros uh, uh, cross-linked agarose beads, okay, uh, that you put a mixture of things that are different sizes on them, and the big stuff comes out first, and the small stuff comes out later. And it's because the beads are porous, and small stuff gets hung up in the pores in the beads, and big stuff can't get into the pores, so it goes in the spaces between the beads, and those spaces are bigger than the pores. And I'm doing all this because I have to tell you, I think I've related this before sometime on TWIV. My, one of my first member, uh, mentors, Harry Nuller, when he was describing to me how Cephidex gel yeah. filtration worked, he said, think of it this way. You got a forest and you got a bunch of adults and kids outside the forest and you send them running through the forest and the adults come out first because the kids climb the trees. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So well, I thought the biochemistry was just glorious. Um, one of my, uh, just a little side note, these are glycosylated proteins. Mm. So I had to check in the methods and make sure that they are in fact produced in mammalian cells. They're recombinant proteins. They use mm -hmm. 293 cells. Um, so, go ahead. Well, I was just going to tell a different um, Cephidex story. Which oh, okay, is, good. Was, <laughs> it was kind of a, a semi-insult uh, about a, a generic person who um, misses, uh, misses the big stuff. It's uh, sort of the, the man with the G10 <laughs> mind. The big stuff goes right on through and they retain all the tiny little details. <laughs> Okay. I like it. See, I just think it's funny that um, the person who taught Rich about Cephidex somehow must be intellectually related to the person who taught me about electrophoresis. Ah, okay. Um, which in electrophoresis, you have the opposite, right. that the big things get hung up and the small things go right through. Um, and I was taught that it was about an elephant and a mouse trying to run through the jungle. <laughs> um, and the elephant would get caught on all of the branches and things and the mouse would be able to go right through. Okay. And for however many years that I have taught students this, um, I spend the rest of the day and I will spend the rest of today um, with the Creedence Clearwater Revival song, Run Through the Jungle, in my head. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> because of having to explain that. So, uh, two other thoughts. Uh, first of all, this concept of a nanoparticle making a better immunogen uh, seems to be a growing thing. Mm. Uh, that's the case with this Novavax vaccine, as we've already pointed out. That's a nanoparticle. It goes, and, and to me, uh, I, I think I'm correct in saying that uh, this reminds me of the fact that virus-like proteins, virus-like particles, uh, typically work better than monomers. I'm thinking of the papillomavirus virus vaccine, among others. That's uh, if you take the papillomavirus 
a capsid protein and use that as a monomer, as an immunogen, it doesn't work very well at all, as I understand it. But if you make a virus-like particle, it does. And I think that's probably because of multimerization and clustering of these epitopes. And they, they have uh, sort of, uh, they attempt an explanation of this. I think this it says multimerization can enhance the immuniz- immunogenicity of subunit vaccines through several mechanisms, including more efficient B cell receptor cross-linking, triggering of innate B cell responses, lymph node trafficking, and enhanced major histocompatibility complex class two antigen presentation. So there's a number of different explanations for this. So I think we're going to see more of this down the road. And uh, lastly, I'm thinking how you would do a human trial. Mm. Because you're going to need really compelling data. Among other things, it seems to me you're going to have to do it in children. Because you want to start with a naive population, right? And by the time right. you're five or ten years old, you've seen this virus and you've mounted an immune response. So this is going to be a uh, clinically, I would think, down the road, a tough problem. Yeah, they've done phase two, so we could look at that and and figure out what they did. Yeah. But that's a good point. Yeah, I, I would guess the phase two was done in adults, right? I would, I would think. Let me so, see but- here, phase two. Uh, where is that one? Phase two trial failed to protect. That's reference 51. A randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial in healthy young adults. How would you... Safety, you immunogenicity, have- and efficacy. So what? Do you, maybe you're looking at when they reactivate and, and make virus if the vaccine makes a difference, right? I mean, I guess they could also do kind of zero surveys beforehand yeah. and only look at a, people who are negative. Let's see. Let's look at this. We have a 181. Zero negative. Right. 100, yep. It's, zero it's, negative. It's, that's right. Yep. And then you, you can find zero negative if you look at young enough, right? Yep. Yeah. And then they there look at go. conversion. Yeah. So this is a, a GP350 vaccine. Um. So the vaccine had efficacy, 78% preventing development of infectious mono. So that's the endpoint, infectious mono. Yeah. Because you can't look for antibodies to GP350 because that's what you're immunizing with, right? 78% efficacy in preventing infectious mono. Hmm. I wonder how long that lasts. You know, because it would be interesting to know if the memory cells are good and so forth, right? Right. Do people just become seropositive later? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if they followed them up. Interesting. And then if it works, if you can get it to work well, then you can go into younger kids, right? 30 to 40% of adolescents age greater than or equal to 15 years. Yeah. Mean age of 20.5 years. In these in this trial, yeah, I remember hearing a talk years ago about EBV and and studies done in colleges. They say you know if you come to college and you're EBV negative, ninety five percent of them are going to be positive by the end of college, right? So yeah, you have to get them before they seroconvert. Interesting, very interesting. Maybe in the next 20 years, we'll have an EBV vaccine. Well, the, the other thing I thought of is that there, there is a, now an effective subunit vaccine for another herpes virus, the yeah. um, um, varicella mm-hmm. zoster. Yeah. And I had to look up the package insert on that to make sure because that is a glycoprotein E, I think it is, which I don't know what equivalent that is relative to EBV or if there is an equivalent, but that is a monomer. Okay. They may, or mm-hmm. at least, or at least, there's nothing in the uh, production information that I can see that suggests that it is deliberately oligomerized, uh, and it's produced, you know, in vitro and lyophilized actually, and reconstituted before it's injected. So, for what it's worth, I'm looking at the package insert. Yeah, it's GE. Yeah. <laughs> 
and uh, aluminum sulfate adjuvant. Did you get it? Yeah. I have to get it. I have not yet gotten it. Okay, so that is our um, snippet. I forgot. Oh, I wanted to mention in, in the update section. <laughs> sorry, I forgot this, but uh, over at the CDC, they've put a nice section on monkeypox, clinical recognition, and distinguishing features from smallpox. Um, and they have a very nice, they have a bunch of nice pictures of the rash. And then they have a time course uh, from Inanthem, that is the lesions in the mouth and tongue through the rash on the skin and the timing, right? First lesions develop on the tongue and mouth. And then uh, one to two days later, you get a macular rash, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very nice if you'd like to know more about monkeypox. I, I did laugh a little bit at the very beginning of it, though. <laughs> Um, because it said you can recognize potential monkeypox infection based on the similarity of its clinical course to that of ordinary discrete smallpox. And I wondered how many clinicians had seen ordinary discrete smallpox right. uh, for that to be useful. Good point. Okay. All right. So now for a paper, we have a COVID paper for you. Uh, this is published in Science Translational Medicine. The anti-SARS-CoV-2 monoclonal antibody, bam Lanivimab minimally impacts the endogenous immune response to COVID-19 vaccination. I, and this is a question a lot of people have had, I noticed. You know, if I get monoclonals, is it going to impact um, subsequent immunity? So this addresses that in an interesting way. Uh, this comes from Eli Lilly, University of North Carolina, and NIH. We have two first authors, Robert Benshop and Jay Tuttle. And Ben Shop is also the corresponding author. So, yeah, if you get treated for, with a monoclonal and then you get vaccinated later, is the monoclonal going to interfere in some way? And this was done back when bam lenivimab was being used. Um, it is since not used because uh, variants have become resistant to neutralization by it. But this study was done back then. And I'm glad to know that you're pronouncing bam lenivimab slowly as well. I have to. <laughs> uh, because I tried to explain this to someone earlier today, and I may have called it bam vanilla mab. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if you do it fast, at least me, I can't pronounce it. I get all messed up. But Dan used to call it bam bam, right? Yeah. 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 The, the thing that I think is also important based on what you were just saying, Vincent, sort of the rationale for even doing this study is that in the absence of data, I'm just quoting him directly, in the absence of data, both the mm. WHO and CDC recommend deferring vaccination yeah. for 90 days following monoclonal antibody treatment. Um, and now CDC recommends vaccine deferral for 30 days, but it's still sort of, we don't have data, so we're being conservative. Yeah. Or they were being conservative. Yeah. yeah. So this is a um, uh, post hoc analysis. So basically, we have a trial for BAM lanivimab. <laughs> BAM lanivimab. BAM BAM. BAM BAM. The Blaze Two trial, a Phase Three randomized double blind placebo controlled single dose study to see whether BAM BAM prevents uh, infection in in people working in the staff and in the residents of a nursing of nursing and assisted living facilities, which have a high risk of exposure, of course. So, you you give them the monoclonals, and it's a study to see you have a control group, you have the treated group, and you see what happens to both. But then you have a lot of samples from both, and they all get vaccinated later. A good number of them get vaccinated, and you could ask, uh, how do they respond? So, pretty neat. Um, so we have, uh, and it's post hoc because we're looking at it after it's done, right? 498 samples, uh, 135 people who never were infected. So these are people being treated with the antibody. Some of them have never been infected. 135 have never been infected. Uh, and uh, they either got bam bam or placebo. Uh, during the study, and then they were vaccinated later. Uh, and they were vaccinated during the 
time the trial was still ongoing, so they're taking samples, right? And they can say, oh, let's check for antibodies after they got vaccinated and compare the ones who got Bam Bam and those who didn't. That's basically how it works, right? And that will answer the question, does, does it matter? And so the first vaccine dose, you know, as you might imagine, they got them at different times because that's not part of the trial. These people are just out and getting their vaccine 43 to 127 days. Um, 95 participants received the first vaccine dose within 90 days of Bam Bam or placebo. And most people got a second dose 21 or 28 days later. And I think we're, we're measuring basically after that second dose here. Okay, so then um, they measure the, they take the sera from this collection of people and they look at the antibody, the binding antibody response. And they use, for the ELISA, they use a spike protein or a receptor binding domain that has a single amino acid change at 484. And then they have, they use also in the same assay, the end terminal domain of the spike. The, the epitope for Bam Bam is within the RBD, the receptor binding domain. And that amino acid change prevents it from binding. So you're not going to have interference with Bam Bam in your binding assays for what the vaccine did. That's right. pretty cool, You're measuring right? just the mm -hmm. effect of the vaccine. And that's pretty what they cool. call endogenous, right? Endogenous uh, <clears throat> antibodies as opposed to the ones they gave you, the exogenous antibodies. Um, so here's the story. Uh, compared to placebo, treatment with Bam Bam gave an, a 1.8-fold and a two-fold lower antibody titer against these two proteins, basically, uh, that we've just described. So some there's some decrease in binding, but not huge, right? It's not like five or tenfold. When they get around to the discussion, they have a lot of discussion about how much antibody it might take to prevent disease. Yeah. That yep. uh, leads them to the conclusion that a twofold decrease is not clinically significant. Yeah, I mean, this is all about antibodies and neutral, uh, neutralizing titers, um, at binding titers. But um, I really would like to know um, if, there, if there's any impact on disease, right? <laughs> yeah, you'd like to know kind of if there's impact on disease and kind of the breadth of different types of immune responses um, that might I come up. I guess T cells also would be interesting, right? Sure. Because... The, uh, the theory is that the monoclonals might be binding up the uh, the vaccine and antigens and therefore reducing the T-cell response. They go yeah, to so great pay. We've had this discussion uh, about correlates of protection all yeah. through the pandemic, and they go to great lengths in this paper uh, to uh, document uh, the possible correlation between antibody levels and protection. Yeah. Okay, And uh, with... Uh, a, a lot of references, so I, I can't really speak to the uh, uh, validity validity of that. But they seem convinced that uh, there is a is in fact a significant correlation between antibody levels and protection from disease. I guess. Well, infection, right? Or disease? Which one? Uh, actually, I'd have to look back and read the paper <laughs> again, see what they say. I let, let me uh, when you guys remember. are wrapping, yeah. let okay. me cruise. All right, so that's really the story here. But then they start they they divide up the data to see if there are any differences. Remember, they have staff, they have residents, and the staff are younger than the residents. <laughs> it's, these are nursing facilities, right? Assisted living, mm -hmm. uh, and they've gotten different kinds of vaccines. They've gotten spike vax. Some have gotten spike vax. Some got community. So they divide up the data. Um, so antibody titers from the staff were 2.7 and 2.3 times higher than from the residents. So the staff median age is 43 and the residents are 72. That's not a big surprise. No. <laughs> mm -mm. It's your senescence, right? Immunosenescence. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. Um, the um, effect, if you compare to two 
the effect of ty- of antibodies on the two proteins similar for residents and staff. The me- vaccines didn't make any difference. Um, so on- only the, uh, the the binding titers, the, the age made a difference there. Um, and they also did the same ex- exercise with a beta variant, which is also not bound by BAM BAM. So they got the same results basically. And um, they also looked at the full length wild type spike and the wild type RBD uh, and didn't see any differences because now the, um, the, the antibodies are binding to those, the monoclonals as well. I also looked at high risk versus non high risk staff. Does that make a difference? So people who are at high risk of developing severe disease versus uh, non high risk people, um, and uh, whether the titers, uh, the infusion affected them differently, and um, the 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 bam bam the effect of bam bam on vaccine induced antibodies uh, was lower for the high risk compared with the non high risk one point eight fold lower. And so that's actually really good because I think you'd be more likely to give bam. Bl- bam lenivimab <laughs> to the high risk individuals. Yeah, that's right. Um, and so you might say, well, we have to make sure that it still works well in the high risk individuals. And yeah. it seems like it actually is just fine in them. Right. And then they did some neutralization assays. They have, um, well, they have not, not one is a, they're both functional assays. One is uh, blocking um, interaction of uh, ACE2 with um, ACE2 binding inhibition and neutralization of infectivity using a pseudovirus, okay? So one is a neutralization titer, one is a binding titer. Um, And um, compared with placebo, Bam Bam gave you a 4.1-fold reduction of binding antibodies to ACE2. Um, But... um, they didn't find differences in, um, oh, right, they did. Sorry, inhibition titers, two and a half times higher for staff than residents. Again, as we saw before, no difference in the vaccine, um, et cetera. But neutralization potency, um, we're using pseudovirus, vesicular stomatitis, uh, pseudovirus. Um, no differences in neutralization potency. Uh, for placebo or bam bam, so no differences in neutralization. Even though we just said, you know, there's this 1.8 fold difference. When you look at neutralization, no difference, and it and obviously no difference in high or low risk. Um, no no difference based on the vaccine uh, as well. So uh, they they then go on to sh- to do statistical procedures showing that all these these properties that they've measured correlate. Uh, with each other, uh, they've also they do also do look at time. Uh, they have a series of uh, s- samples from different times between 43 and 127 days after vaccination, and they can divide people into groups um, between uh, the the bam bam and and the vaccine dose, uh, and um, they. No, they find no obvious differences between the immune responses. So whether you are close to the infusion in the middle distance or far away from the, it doesn't matter. You all uh, have pretty much similar um, at titers in, in neutralization assays anyway. So that's basically the data. I think that's interesting. Um, I presume it extends to the current monoclonals that are being used, bebtilovimab, right? That's easier to say. I presume it extends to that, but this study doesn't address it. This study doesn't address Omicron, of course, but basically they're saying you should get vaccinated as soon as you can, right? Prompt right. vaccination, which outweighs um, uh, the uh, any potential problems with uh, interference with the vaccine. Or, you know, you don't want to wait because you, you might get infected. I think I remember hearing from Daniel uh, the phrase, uh, never miss an opportunity to vaccinate. Uh, and this would support that. Yeah. 
So the I, CDC I, currently does 30 days, it recommends 30 days after infusion or? Well, that's what they, that's what they said in their introduction. Yeah. So, but yeah, I, I would just like to sort of state it again, again, reading from their discussion, all the participants demonstrated a robust immune response to full vaccination, regardless of preceding bamlanivimab or placebo infusion and regardless of age, risk category, or vaccine type, and the interval between when they got the monoclonal and the COVID-19 vaccination didn't affect this conclusion either. So that's the bottom line. The only so qualification I had on that was that their earliest um, vaccination after uh, Bam Bam was 40 days, yeah, which is yeah. a, a significant period of time. But then they go on to say that whether it's 40 days or two intervals later didn't make any difference. Yeah. And so they sort of imply that earlier wouldn't make any difference either. And then they go through a long wrap on, on uh, basically <laughs> how much how much antibody do you actually need to confer protection and talk about how uh, if, you've, uh, if your antibody titers have waned to something like 10% of your initial titers after uh, immunization, you're still like 90%. Uh, protected, so uh, they they have a number of different arguments to suggest that, um, despite the fact that their first point is forty days afterwards, and your bam bam titers are going to be uh, higher if you vaccinate earlier, that you're still going to be, be in better shape if you vaccinate. So the latest guidance from CDC: do not wait after hmm. your infusion; you can get vaccinated huh. right away. Okay. Okay, good. The exception is Evusheld. Uh, if you get, um, if you're vaccinated, you should wait at least two weeks before getting Evusheld. So that would be for immunocompromised, immunosuppressed people. And it's the other way. It's uh -huh. if if you're vaccinated, you should wait. No, it says here if you, it says not, people who have received the COVID vaccination should wait at least two weeks before receiving Evusheld. Right, and the, and this paper is looking at the other, when you should yeah. get the vac the other way around. Yeah. When you would get a vaccine after having received Evusheld. Yeah, I know. I'm just wondering why um, why you Maybe would they have assume if you're at high risk, you've been vaccinated. So in... in in that population, do they give them both? They vaccinate and then give every shell? They do. And is, is it in that order? The vaccine? I think that many of them have already been vaccinated. Right. So if it happens that you have just been vaccinated and yeah. you, uh, well, I, yeah, wait. Yeah. So I, if, you're a, if you're a high risk person and you yeah. get infected, whether or not you're vaccinated, there is still some risk of disease. And so if you are in that high risk group, even when you're vaccinated, you still should also get a V-shield right. to reduce your risk. And this study doesn't address that kind of right. Right. No. sequence at all, but they're saying two weeks, which would be, you know, enough to allow the, the uh, it's an mRNA vaccine for the antigen to be made and you would respond to right. it, right? Yeah. Okay. So folks, many people have asked, so if you've got a monoclonal infusion, it's not going to... Uh, interfere with your vaccination. Yep. Okay, let's do a couple of emails. Rich, can you take that first one, please? Katarina writes, Dear Vincent and Twiv crew, thank you for discussing our recently published paper, quote, a novel lineage tracing mouse model for studying early MMU PV1 infections, end quote, in episode 904. So this was about uh, papillomavirus, a mouse model for papillomavirus. Yes. I am a longtime listener and patron of TWIV, so it was fantastic surprise to hear your insights and feedback. Since our paper was constrained by word limit, we did not have the chance to expand the discussion as much as we would have liked, so I want to address one small point. Specifically, lineage tracing models in contrast to virus reporter models, which are more commonly used in virology, are better suited to follow the progeny of cells which init initially receive the viral genome. After initial activation of 
the heritable reporter. Cells could be traced even after they have lost the viral genome. Thus, while our model clearly enables studies of cellular dynamics during the first few days of viral gene transcription, it also lays the groundwork for following cells after gene transcription has stopped. Hopefully in the future, this strategy will enable us to address questions such as the mechanisms of persistence and potentially hit and run effects of the virus. So just to remind people, this was a, a paper where they had a mouse model that allowed you to infect it with a <clears throat> mouse papillomavirus and that would um, trigger the infected cells to make uh, a fluorescent protein so that those cells were now marked as having been infected. And as they uh, divided and evolved, they would still be marked so you can trace their fate. Uh, and one of the things that she's pointing out here is that they are permanently altered so that even if they lose the viral genome, you can uh, still follow the cells and see what happens. And as I'm reading this, I think you could probably stain those cells to determine whether or not they still had the viral genome as well uh, and uh, learn a lot more, stain them with other things too, learn a lot more about the uh, lineage. Great. Thanks again for taking the time to discuss our work. Best regards, Katerina Strati, uh, who's an associate professor at the University of Cyprus, and she's the uh, person who was Paul Lambert's graduate student. Mm. Thank you, Katerina, for your support. Yeah. Appreciate it. Uh, Kathy, can you take the next one? Yes. Matthias writes, Dear TWIV team, hope you are all doing well. I'm a big fan of TWIV, and while I was listening to episode 907, I realized that during a discussion on SARS-CoV-2 in cats and dogs, you guys were wondering about clinical signs in deer infected with SARS-CoV-2. I'm a postdoc at Cornell University in Ithaca, and in collaboration with the National Animal Disease Center, USDA, ARS, Ames, Iowa, we conducted two cohorts inoculating SARS-CoV-2 in WTD. White-tailed deer. Oh, white-tailed deer. In a lab <laughs> set condition, high containment facility, ABSL3. In the first study, and he gives a link, open access, we assessed the susceptibility of white-tailed deer fawns and the ability to transmit the virus to their contacts. We have shown that fawns inf inoculated with SARS-CoV-2 shed high viral titer and are able to transmit the virus to other fawns in the same room, even with no direct contact, most likely by aerosol. These results raised a red flag and made us consider investigating SARS-CoV-2 in free-ranging white-tailed deer. Then we decided to conduct a second study, it gives a link, uh, and that one's also open access. We investigated the transmission dynamics of SARS-CoV-2 fawns by adding contact animals on days three, six, or nine post-infection and to find the major sites of viral replication during the acute phase of infection. Additionally, we assessed the evolution of the virus as it replicated and transmitted between animals. Going back to the question about clinical signs in deer infected with SARS-CoV-2, no clinical signs were observed in any of the animals from either study. Except from a slight and transient increase in body temperature on day one or two post infection. Obviously, we should consider that these were observations based on a small number of experimentally infected deer. However, if the same happens in natural infections, it could benefit virus transmission among free ranging white tailed deer. Thanks for all you do sharing high quality <laughs> information. Kind regards, Matthias. Hmm. No the, uh, the titers that these animals are shedding, I assume it's in, you know, nasal wash yeah. or swabs yeah. or something, are uh, pretty impressive. 10 to the yeah. 6, a million PFU yeah. per mil. Yeah. Those might it's, be interesting papers we, to discuss. Yes, I was thinking of that. This is uh, really interesting that they don't have symptoms, so they're presumably yeah. just running around as running deer around like spreading to do. virus. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. I like every time he wrote open access, he gave a little emoji with a <laughs> wink. That's so cute. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love it. All right. Thanks, Matthias. Matthias is in the deal lab up at Cornell. 
Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Wendy writes, hi, Twivers. I am a student in BI 115, Viruses and Applications to Biological Systems at Caltech. Thank you guys for your amazing contents on virology, immunity, and the COVID clinical updates. I have a question from when I was viewing episode 898. When you guys talked about micro needle patches versus intramuscular injection of vaccine, I was thinking, would the patch method offer more protection to viruses that transmit using skin t- contact, like HPV, versus influenza, because the patch immunization method is more similar to the natural transmission route of the virus? Just a speculation. Uh, best regards, Wendy. Mm. Um, I haven't seen um, anyone look at that, so I'm not completely sure. Uh, and do we know, is it always transmitted by skin contact for HPV or is it some of it at the muco- mucosal site sort of near skin? Uh, it depends on the virus. Right. Uh, I think it depends right. on which HPV you're talking about. There are mucosal HPVs hmm. and skin HPVs. Uh, maybe, Wendy. Um, I know that the immune response in the skin is quite different than the immune response in some other locations. Um, and as a result, I could s- imagine that um, this could be particularly useful for viruses that transmit by skin uh, contact, but I, I haven't seen any data so, on it. So, Brianne, are mucosa and skin connected immunologically? Um, I think that some mucosa and some skin um, have some similarities. However, yeah. uh, I have been learning from one of my former students who has become very into skin immunology, <laughs> um, some of the ins and outs of skin immunology, and it's uh, quite unique. Uh, so I think that it is the uniqueness of the immune responses in the skin are underestimated. So my, my, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that if you, is that various mucosa are connected Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. So if you immunize in the gut, you can wind up uh, with immunity in some other mucosa or or the other way around. Correct. Right. But, I believe so. Yes. Uh, uh, but uh, it, does the same sort of connection exist between mucosa and skin? I I lean towards I lean towards <laughs> no. But again, what I have learned is that. All skin is not equal, okay. just like all types of mucosa are not equal. Okay. So maybe skin that has hair and skin that doesn't have hair, for example, might be different. Hmm. And so whether whether both of those are connected to mucosa versus one or the other, I, I don't know enough. I've just learned that skin with hair and skin without hair are different. Like the palms of my hands versus the back of my hands? I think so, wow. yes. What about when I lose my hair? Does it change the immunological characteristics? <laughs> I, I think that there's something about how many sweat glands are in the skin. Ah, hmm. fascinating. Well, I really want to see these micro needle patches. I want to see more about that because uh, that, that conceptually is fascinating. Uh, also, the, the student who has taught me all of this about skin listens to TWIV. Um, so I expect that I will get a lengthy message okay, explaining good. all of this. I think we should get a micro needle patch person on to talk about. Ooh, good idea. That right? Wouldn't that be good? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, Rich, I was just thinking the first time I heard about the micro needle patches was at one of those Southeast regional virology meetings. So, oh, is that right? Hmm. Yeah. I went to one or two of those after I was here in Michigan, but. The, it's been a while, so it you seems don't remember like these micro needle patches. You? No, but the, but, but the, it was somebody from the CDC. I'm pretty sure. Uh, somebody out been, there listening is going to know. Yeah, yeah but, I, I remember hearing talks about them when I was in graduate school, yeah. and I know yeah. who gave those so talks. It's been a while. Yeah, that this has been in the works. Uh, so, anyone, Wendy, I think the uh, uh, high level answer to your question is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Amy writes, first, I would like to thank you for doing these podcasts. I am a regular listener and appreciate your peer review of latest evidence and helping me better understand immunology and virology. My question is, how do vaccines at the cellular level protect against severe COVID in a person who has autoantibodies against interferon, alpha and omega? Do they not protect? I wonder if some patients whom the vaccine supposedly failed were failed in quotes, were those who had large amounts of these targeted autoantibodies prior to infection. 
I'm a nurse vaccinated and boosted who's exhausted from dealing with the fallout of misinformation and the anti-vax movement. Thank you. Well, I think that's a very good suggestion, right? I don't think there are data <clears throat> that would say, you know, in people uh, in which uh, who develop severe disease, even though they are vaccinated, what's the problem? And many of them have comorbidities, right? We know certain health age, certain health conditions, BMI, heart disease, et cetera, make it more likely you're going to have serious disease. But yeah, I would bet that autoantibodies might contribute to it, right? Because uh, it's, especially when you're far out from the vaccine and you're depending on a memory recall, there the interferons are going to play an important role. And if you're neutralizing them, that would be a problem. What do you think, Brianne? Yeah, I could imagine also that the type 1 interferons might be really important in setting up the vaccine-elicited response at the beginning. So helping those mm -hmm. um, B cells and T cells um, make their initial response well. Um, and so I could imagine that someone who had these autoantibodies might make a reduced response to the vaccine, um, perhaps to a level that it uh, uh -huh. would okay. not be protective. Um, is my first thought, uh, but I agree that I would love to uh, see some more information on that, and I don't think this information's out there. Good question. <clears throat> All right, let's do one more round. We're back to Rich. Anonymous writes, I have esophageal strictures and can't swallow most pills. I'm also fairly high risk for severe covid even though I am vaccinated and boosted, I really like the idea of having a backup like Paxlovid available. However, I've just read on drugs.com about Paxlovid, quote, the tablets should be swallowed whole and not chewed, chewed broken, or crushed, end quote. So is Paxlovid not an option for people like me? Sounds like. This guideline makes uh, sense to me. Uh, with time release medications or drugs that can damage the stomach, but I'm unclear about what is behind this requirement in the case of Paxlovid. The phrasing is should be rather than must be. Is it just that pills are swallowed whole during the trials and have not been tested if they are broken or crushed? Or is there a chemical, pharmacological, or physiological reason that it is necessary for an intact pill to arrive in the stomach before it is broken down by the digestive system? Under dosage forms and strengths, drugs.com entry also says that uh, Nirma Mirnatlovir is supplied as an oval pink immediate release. So it's not a matter of delayed release, at least with this component. Thanks in advance. I really appreciate your Friday clinical updates, as well as uh, Vincent and his other guests. It's like a breath of fresh air to hear scientific and professional discourse without drama and hysteria. It's like an island of sanity in the roiling sea of YouTube. Um, <laughs> so uh, first of all, I want to say that you've thought this through. Uh, and I'm impressed with uh, your uh, research. Uh, this is good. Second, I want to say, <laughs> I don't know, but Vincent found <laughs> something here. What did you find, Vincent? Well, there's this website, dysphagiacafe.com, for people <laughs> with dysphagia. And uh, they say, you know, there are a lot of reasons why you, beyond timed release, why you wouldn't have to, we wouldn't be able to crush a pill. In fact, this article has a subheading called Don't Rush to Crush. And there's a, apparently an Australian Don't Rush to Crush handbook. A required reference for pharmacists includes information on the impact of crushing 570 different medications. Whoa. Hmm. The default position is not to crush unless the therapeutic impact is understood for each tablet. And there are reasons, and one of them is controlled release, but there are also immediate release medications. Uh, there are cases where you haven't tested whether crushing is going to be issue. If you don't crush evenly, it's going to it's going to make a difference. You know, so there are a lot of other reasons. But I asked Daniel Griffin, why can't you crush it? 
And he said, I think there's a coating on it. I don't know what that means. He said, I think there's a coating. Daniel, what did you mean by that? You mean the coating is important? Is it an enteric coating so that it doesn't do its thing till it gets That's, to the that, intestine that rather than the thinking. stomach? I don't know. So I've uh, I've got the uh, package insert here, so I will. Uh, it says don't crush it. it. Yeah, it says don't crush it, and I don't know, but they don't tell you why, as you might guess. When you read further in the Dysphagia Cafe, they talk about um, some sometimes people use applesauce or things like that, and. That's not a good thing, but there are some things called pill swallowing gels that you can use that's placed over the tablet on a teaspoon to ha- administer the medication. But yeah. I suppose depending <sighs> on the dysphagia, it, the, maybe that still doesn't work for people. Because hmm. um, you know there are pill crushers, in. right? You can buy pill crushers and some yeah, people use but, them, right? It induces patient risk unless it's done in full awareness of the effect on the properties of a specific medication. And that's what this listener is trying to find out. Yeah. All the uh, the package insert says, uh, as she already uh, quoted, that uh, nirmatlavir geez, is available <laughs> as immediate release film-coated tablets and ritonavir is available as film-coated tablets, so it doesn't say immediate release. So it implies that there's a difference, but it doesn't elaborate. I mean, if the coding facilitates immediate release, maybe you don't get immediate release without when you break it up. Is that that possible? I don't know. That's possible. I mean, you know, it doesn't make sense when you listen to it, but (laughs) I don't know why crushing it would, but... Anyway, Daniel said it has some kind of coating that needs to be intact, and I don't know what the coating is for. So if anyone so, knows, yeah, send, yeah, send us, us more know. email. Or maybe she can write to the company and ask them, ask Pfizer. Right? You know, that's interesting. That just, it would was, be nice if yeah. in the package inserts or whatever they had instructions or recommendations for right. people who couldn't swallow these things. Right. I guess my question is, how many different options have they tested to be able to really include them in the package insert? Yeah. I mean, technically, yeah. you should do the trial with crushing to make sure, right? Yeah, that was yeah. one of her. That was but one I of don't, her yeah. thoughts. I doubt that they did that, right? Right. I, I know some people at Pfizer. I'm yeah. going to write to them and ask them. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, we don't know that this is a woman. It's just anonymous. Ah, it right. is anonymous. Yeah. <laughs> Hmm. Could be the one. No, okay. No, I thought it was a she. Um, Kathy, you're next. Mike writes, it's 27C, 81 Fahrenheit, and, a, and clear in New York City. When I got my first booster so far, I made the mistake of thinking that I should try to spread the material as if it were fertilizer and got the shot in my right arm, having gotten the first two in my left arm. Now, after reading the article referenced below and listening again to the B-Cell Boot Camp episode, I see that I was using a completely mistaken metaphor. It's more like put a book in an otherwise empty room and a student appears. Put more books on the same general subject in the same room and the student reads them and builds on the knowledge gained from the previous books. But if you now decide to go to a different empty room, you have to put a copy of the first book there and the new student who appears reads only that one book and adds almost nothing to the more comprehensively educated person in the first room. It's a start. It's a bit too magical. But someone who is better with metaphors should be able to bring it into common sense, real world imagery. And then uh, says, okay, here's the haiku. And it's haiku for recall of B-cell memory on vaccination location, science immunology, mentioned in TWIV 899 COVID-19 clinical update, 114 with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Flowers in full bloom. I feel ill on occasion. Same arm. Right. I know. <laughs> Good. That, that is uh, the, Gabriel's paper, right, Brianne? Yes. Yes, it is. I think the the book thing works really well, doesn't it? I think it does. I think that um, you know there there are immunological questions in the field about how much the students get to leave different rooms um, and go to uh, uh, 
yeah. to f- stay in the first room versus go to a second room. Uh, but um, that is Gabriel's paper. Uh, so, Brianne, can you summarize that? Was that on immune? Uh, that's, I, I think it I was never, on immune. I never caught yes. that. Give me a... Yeah, so um, we had a guest, uh, Gabriel Victoria, who was looking at um, what happened in, uh, as a germinal center kind of changed over time um, and saw that um, if you were to keep getting uh, boosted in the same arm, thus you would kind of be getting um, responses made by the same germinal centers and they were better than if you were to move uh, into the other arm. Interesting. Okay. Yes. Same Gabriel Victoria that was on TWIV years ago, remember? Yeah, sure. Same guy. Uh, Concerto in B. That's right. Never forget that episode. This one was B Cell Boot Camp. That's a good one, too. All right. um, Brianne, you're next. Ben writes Dear TWIVsters, like many other people, I have been suffering from pollen allergy, grasses, birch, since I was a kid. I learned during Vincent's virology live classes last year that measles can erase a lot of the immune memory. I was wondering today about the impact of this on allergies. Could this also reset the body's overly ambitious response to pollen? Or is this mediated by a different part of the immune system? Not that I would want a measles infection to get rid of allergies, but maybe we could learn something about the underlying mechanisms to help develop treatment, maybe using a model. Thanks for all you do and stay safe. Um, and Ben uh, said he is the guy with the Back to the Future t-shirt at the Richard Ernst <laughs> Lecture in Zurich. <laughs> uh, ben, I love the idea as someone who also suffers from those pollen allergies. Um, I think that uh, we I'm not sure from the data I've seen on the measles um effect, how much it impacts IgE specific B cells, which are usually the problem with our pollen allergies um, compared to others. So I don't know if it could um, reset the specific responses to pollen. Um, It certainly couldn't get rid of the IgE that you had already made that is already on your mast cells. um, That's already causing you a problem. Um, However, the idea of figuring out a way to reset the overly ambitious response is one that I wholeheartedly support um, and would get in line for quickly. But the effect is because the virus infects B cells, right? Right, exactly. So there's no reason to think that the, the IgE B cells are any different, right? Yeah, so you'd have to hope that sort of the IgE B cell somehow was getting um, reduced, but you'd still have a whole lot of mast cells covered with IgE yeah. that had already okay. been made. Yeah, they didn't look at that in the study because they just used uh, peptides, viral peptides to, to, right. to score antibodies. Yeah. All right, the last one's from Jerry, who uh, he addresses this to Rich and other Twiverati. Congrat- and you'll see why. Ha- congratulations on having bumped our local Sunday NPR lineup. Although a latecomer to your podcast, I get it. So you listen to us instead of NPR. Is yeah. that right? Good. Wise choice. <laughs> Although a latecomer to your podcast, having only become twiv aware since the beginning of the pandemic, I'm now a true devotee. You've even managed to hook my wife, who is head of medical genetics at our university and so much better position to understand the nuances of your discussions compared to me, a mere neuroradiologist and health services researcher. Not only are you my go-to source for all questions virological, but your wit, wisdom, healthy skepticism, and rational approach to science and life has been sustaining and entertaining during this past pandemic period. So thank you. You're welcome. Very nice. I was partaking in my usual Sunday morning ritual of listening to Twiv, and on your episode 907, Rich mentioned a lack of familiarity with receiver operating characteristic ROC curves, a topic that, for once, was in the wheelhouse of radiologists since ROC curves are frequently used to report the accuracy of diagnostic tests. Just brace yourself, folks, okay? (laughs) Yeah, here it comes. (laughs) As you know and have discussed on TWIV, sensitivity and specificity are two common metrics for assessing diagnostic accuracy of dichotomous, that is, positive or not, tests. 
For many, if not most diagnostic tests, one can choose the threshold for test positivity, which will in turn alter the sensitivity and specificity. Take cycle threshold values for RT-PCR. A given lab may report values of 24 and below as positive compared to some sort of reference standard. This would then result in one set of values for sensitivity and specificity. However, the same lab could have used a different cycle threshold for positivity, resulting in different sensitivity and specificity values. Thus, the limitation of simply reporting sensitivity and specificity is that it only examines how well a test performs for a given positivity threshold. ROC curves examine test performance across the entire spectrum of positivity thresholds by plotting sensitivity versus one one minus specificity. You might recognize this formula, sensitivity over one minus specificity as the likelihood ratio, LR, or in English, the likelihood that a patient has a positive test result if they have the disease, sensitivity, over the likelihood that they have a positive test result but don't have the disease, one minus specificity. This ratio is another useful metric for assessing test performance and often the following rule of thumb is used. LRs, likelihood ratios over 10, essentially rule in a disease, and LRs less than 0.1 rule out a disease. Examining the entire range of test performance allows the comparison of tests by calculating the area under the ROC curves, or AUC. The maximum possible AUC equals 1, perfect sensitivity, and specificity in a test with no useful diagnostic information as an AUC of 0.5. ROC curves also allow one to look explicitly at the trade-offs at each threshold for sensitivity specificity, usually opting for a higher sensitivity results in a lower specificity and vice versa. There are many Resources on the web explaining LRs and ROC curves, for example, the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, uh, and he gives a link for that. One nice article summarizing ROC curves uh, is, is another in the, in the Canadian Journal of Emerging Emergency Medicine. Sorry for this lengthy missive, but consider it a tribute to TWIV that I was inspired to write this email on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> I hope that I helped to clarify rather than confuse. Actually, it's quite good. I understood yeah, it. Very good. Mm -hmm. And I learned some things. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Jerry is a professor of radiology and neurological surgery at the University of Washington School of Medicine. And if I'm not mistaken, um, was it the EBV paper that uh, came out of UW? Yes, it was. I think so. All so, right. Yes. And I was listening to that episode and you were talking about the ROC curves. My brain went to rot curves, mm. which oh. were only something that were barely touched on as graduate student, as I was a graduate student and were to be avoided at all costs. But I just looked it up. Um, and one thing in the image search says, rot curve is a measure of the kinetic complexity of RNA based on its hybridization ability with mm -hmm. DNA molecules. And that's compared to COT, which is DNA, DNA, right? Correct. Right. I spent, yeah. uh, I remember, an entire grueling weekend trying to figure out why COT curves were plotted with the x-axis being logarithmic. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they give this funny shape of a curve. And I finally figured out it's because the range of numbers is so large that mm -hmm. you couldn't do it otherwise. You have to put it on a large scale. There's no mathematical reason for doing it that way. Jeez. Isn't it get you when you have to spend so much time, you just think of something over and over and you can't figure it out? But you know yeah. what's important is that I wouldn't let that go. I had to know the yeah, answer. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's I right. would not let it go. And- and I think I can't, nobody explained it to me, okay? I just found out that there was no other answer. That was it. 
So this reminds me, and sorry for this diversion, but <laughs> you got you mentioned rot and cot. So in graduate school, one of the first people I, one of the first faculty I encountered was was James Wetmer, who was painfully smart. Just you couldn't figure out what he was talking about often. Um, and he had done, I don't know if it was a PhD or a postdoc with Norman Davidson at Caltech. And he published a paper in the Journal of Molecular Biology, which they made us read. <laughs> and nobody understood it. It was called Kinetics of Renaturation of DNA. And I just looked it up because I could never figure this out. I could probably do it now because I'm much older. <laughs> the, the first line of the abstract, the rate of renaturation of fully denatured DNA is kinetically a second order reaction. The reaction rate increases as the temperature decreases below TM, which is the melting temperature of the DNA, reaching a broad flat maximum from 15 to 30 degrees below the TM and then decreases with a further decrease in temperatures. And then he derived a formula which describes this. That was, and this is a very famous paper, by the way. It used to be because nobody thinks about this any longer. But in the in the days where we used DNA denaturation to measure things, you know, similarity of DNA sequences and so forth was really important. So, th Kathy, you reminded me of that when you talk about rot and cot, which what had I nothing to do with any of this. <clears throat> it's just rock. <laughs> right. What I remember as essential about cot curves was that if you take genomic DNA and melt it and then do reassociation. I guess it's I guess it's over time. Yes. That you get essentially three different curves. You get a component that renatures very yeah. fast. That's another right. Another component that's intermediate and another that's slow. And that was the first clue that there are repetitive sequences in DNA. Because mm -hmm. the repetitive sequences are there in high concentration. So they renature really fast. Things that are less repetitive, uh, but somewhat repetitive, have a an intermediate component, and then uh, unique sequences uh, renature much slower. All right, now remind me when you remember when you denature DNA, you can measure it by by a spectrophotometer, right? Because the the absorbance of single versus double stranded DNA is different, right? Hyperchromicity, dude. Hyperchromicity. So okay. is it when you melt? If you do a spec as you're increasing the temperature. You get this S-shaped curved, right? The OD, the OD increases at the melting temperature. Got it. Okay? Got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's because when you melt it, the bases are exposed more than they are when they're in uh, yeah. a, an annealed form. Man, this I is like it. this is like watching Neil Armstrong land on the moon. This is ancient <laughs> history. This is what <laughs> this is what we did. In, that's, I love that's, it. That was our era. Okay, yeah, that sort I love of stuff. It. It's really good stuff. It makes you understand things at a very <laughs> fundamental level, right? And did you have it beaten into you, the difference between reannealing and hybridization? Ooh, no. No, tell well, us that. So hybridization would be RNA-DNA. Oh, oh, is that right? Or at least that's what I was taught. Because okay. it was a hybrid, it's already, oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Makes Versus sense. Annealing that makes would sense. would be DNA going back with DNA. And then we could talk about Schlieren's and the Model L, right? <sighs> Did you have a Model L, Kathy? No, no. My my exposure to Schlieren is watching cesium come out of a dialysis bag after you've uh, uh, you're dialyzing yes. a, a band from a, a plasmid gradient. Uh, in in my physical chemistry class, we had a, I think it was a student, uh, a graduate student, uh, who was an advanced graduate student working in probably Fred Richards' lab or something like that, though that doesn't necessarily make sense. But he came into class and set up this whole thing to demonstrate Schlieren optics, hmm. which basically, if I recall it correctly, uh, takes the first derivative of a concentration gradient and translates it into something that looks like a peak. We'll get somebody writing in about that. Yeah, it'd be great. I love I loved that we uh, got Jerry excited enough to explain it. It was very good. I appreciate uh, it. Jerry, you also yeah. precipitated quite a digression. Good for you. <laughs> All right, time for some picks of the week. Brianne, what do you have for us? 
so I have an article. Um, it's by Katie Wu, uh, one of the Atlantic science writers who I uh, have been really liking. Um, it's called A Frog So Small It Could Not Frog. <laughs> Um, and it made me laugh a lot. Um, so this is an article about the pumpkin toadlet. Um, you can see a picture of the pumpkin toadlet here and the pumpkin toadlet is very small. Um, it is, uh, said in here as, um, being about the width of a Skittle. Uh, and <laughs> the pumpkin toadlet, um, when it jumps in the air, um, cannot locate where it is. And lands through something called uncontrolled landing. Mm. Um, and so basically it jumps and then kind of falls over um, or it does some tumbling and cartwheeling. Oh. Um, and so it's this whole discussion of the fact that it is a frog that is in fact so small it cannot jump uh, normally. Um, all of this is due to the fact that it is so small that its inner ear doesn't allow it to, um, inner ear structures are too tiny to, for balance to happen. Its inner ear structures are also too tiny um, to allow it to hear mating calls <laughs> from other members of its species. Um, and it's just sort of this kind of hilarious little article uh, about the p pumpkin toadlet and um, and the fact that it has evolved um, to be able to live uh, like this. Um, and it's just a fun little article. I really enjoyed reading it. And I enjoyed learning about the pumpkin toadlet of the width of a Skittle. Scroll down to the movie of it yeah. jumping. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so fun to watch. Yeah. Cute. It's kind of it painful. just kind of falls over. It kind of lands on its nose. Oh, ow. <laughs> you know, this I, is, need, uh, I, I need to read this because, you know, your description leaves me wondering you know what what other characteristics it has that make it survive without yeah. all of those other things that we think of as important so it sounds as if um it is brightly colored uh enough and uh toxic so predators stay uh. away even though it falls over um and there are enough insects in the tropical forest that it can find them even with um it's poor jumps. <laughs> uh, he's not got. Uh, I'm. I'm wondering about his toes. He doesn't yeah. have much going on by way of toes. No. no. This yeah. is like the perfect topic for a science writer, right? Where you can take kind of an obscure thing and get funny about it and and surprise people. It's all the co all the good combinations, right? It yeah. really is. It, I enjoyed reading it. Yeah. Cool. She probably enjoyed it too after so yeah. many articles probably, on COVID, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> yes. exactly. Take a break here, write about this silly right. frog. Kathy, what do you have for us? I have a video <laughs> about the uh, story of Ardman animations. It's a grand night in the story of Ardman. Um, and uh, many of you will know that they created Wallace and Gromit or Morph or things like Chicken Run. Um, and it's just a lot of people talking about the history of Ardman animations and introducing me to the fact that there's a lot of stuff more recently that I was not aware that mm. they were doing. So there's more out there for me to go watch, but it's very entertaining. Uh, uh, this actually shows how they do this animation. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, they, they don't they don't show a whole lot of of the actual stop motion stuff, but you, you see some of the stuff where, you know, where you can see fingerprints and, uh -huh. and it's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely good. Get your grandchildren there and watch. All right, it. I was thinking exactly that. Yeah. Yeah. I used and to they, love and then make a list of which, which things you haven't watched that you need to, to watch <laughs> next. I remember, uh, watching these with, with kids, with our kids, um, we went through a phase where we watched this stuff with, I and mean, you know, the excuse was that the kids like to watch, but I really liked it too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I really liked it. I mean, that's one of the first things that they say in the first couple minutes is that, yeah, adults like it just as much. So. It's, it's smart to make things that appeal to both because then the parents or grandparents enjoy it and the mm -hmm. kids do. It's all good. Yeah. I love the Wallace and Gromit. <laughs> yeah. It's great. Rich, what do you have for us? I have a science fiction movie that was recommended to me by my buddy Grant McFadden called Archive that is 
I will say very little about this because you have to see it. If I say too much, there will be spoilers. Mm. But it is about uh, the an individual who is engaged in developing intelligent robots. Mm. Period. Mm. It's uh, the I can I guess I can say that the it's set in uh, two thousand. It was made two years ago. It's set in 2038. So it's in the future. It's about creating intelligent robots. There you go. Did you ever see Ex Machina? Yes. Uh, similar genre. Yeah. I was thinking of Ex Machina, who was also recommended to me by uh, McFadden. Yeah. Uh, uh, at the same time. So yep. they're both, I, I think Ex Machina was really yeah. good. Is this one good? Yeah. This. Um, I was not sure until I was done. Okay. Uh, uh, I I won't say anymore. Hey, you did. <laughs> Ex Machina is similar, right? Because uh, you don't really get it till it's over. Yeah, right. right. Cool. Very cool. That's good. It looks good. Uh, I have an article by Heron Darwin. Heron is a professor at NYU here in New York. I had her as a guest on TWIM last Sunday on, uh, or is it Monday? Monday. No, it was Sunday at ASM in Washington. And she works on tuberculosis. Um, and she writes a column for EMBO Reports pretty regularly. It's, it's, uh, it's called a um, opinion piece, right? But she has a, a steady series of them. And I have one that's called bandwagoning, which I really like. And it's all about uh, <clears throat> you know when something happens in science and it gets money, people rush to it. So she writes, what's been frustrating are those scientists who are making a Hunger Games-like run for cornucopia of emergency funding for SARS-CoV-2 research or reporting minimal publishable units of data as long as it is somehow related to the virus. Even more disheartening is that many of these scientists have never expressed an interest in infectious disease, let alone virology. I refer to these researchers as bandwagoners. So you get the picture. Um, mm -hmm. I, I asked her, could we talk about this on the, on the podcast? And she said, yeah, as long as nobody has any tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, this is, uh, this is a longstanding pet peeve of mine. And it recalls to mind uh, an, an occurrence where I was going on a big rant about this with my old friend, Karen Sprague. I think it was during the biodefense bubble, and I was probably complaining about uh, research centers of excellence that resulted out of that and some of the wastage involved in that. And going on and on about people chasing the money. And Karen said, dripping with sarcasm, oh, so you think that the question ought to come first and then the money? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is a common thing to happen uh, when, you know, after 9-11. I think she mentions 9-11 yeah. in the article as well. Anyway, she has, uh, I, I like these columns of hers where she has uh, diverse uh, opinions. And so I don't know if it's open access, unfortunately. It may not be, but they're good. And uh, she's not related to Charles Darwin, I asked her. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great name, though. And, and I think, Rich, was this pick sent to you? Uh, yeah, uh, the pick was sent to me. And uh, rather than... Uh, co-opted as my own pick because it was so nicely described in its stuff. I just pasted it in here as a listener pick, which, you know, it was, the email was titled listener pick. So this is from Alan, uh, who writes, likely animal reservoir for Pasteurella pestis strain of Black Death found in marmots of Kyrgyzstan reported in this Nature article. Note, it took, it only took 684 years to find the likely animal reservoir for the Black Death. Thankfully, no one was blaming it on Chinese alchemy. <laughs> now we must encourage field researchers to find a likely animal reservoir for SARS-CoV-2 in order to lead the WHO to revise their recent report, which uh, he also links to uh, the report on that WHO report in the New York Times, uh, which 
you may have seen. Mysteries linger about COVID's origin, WHO uh. report says. Come on. Who wrote this New York Times article? Benjamin Muller and Carl Zimmer. No, mysteries do not linger on. <laughs> I don't know why they keep saying that. And this is from Alan in Las Cruces, New, Mix New Mexico. Thank you. That's cool. I, I saw that email and I, I should have remembered to paste it in. I forgot. Thank you, Rich. It's all right. Doing that. It's cool. 684 years. Presumably it will take <laughs> less time. <laughs> well, I think I, I, it's quite clear that bats are the reservoir. The most closely related SARS-CoV-2 like viruses are in bats, right? And uh, in various parts right. of Asia, as we've covered here on TWIV, it's just we don't know the particular one, right, that gave rise to that one, but... I think it's quite clear that it's bats, but I like that no one blamed it on a chi on Chinese alchemy. That's good. What's Carl doing? <sighs> Continuing this nonsense? I am, of course, I haven't read this article. I but. don't know, but you saw that. What's the guy at Columbia Sachs? Is it David Sachs? Sounds right. Jeffrey Sachs. Jeffrey Sachs, thank oh, you. Jeffrey Sachs, yeah. You know, he's a ecologist or, or economist. He's an economist, economist. right? Mm -hmm. He has an opinion in PNAS saying we need to investigate the origins. I mean, what do you know about that? <laughs> I mean, it's been quite nicely investigated. Just talk to Michael Warby, right? Yeah. In fact, li listen to the TWIV because that was pretty convincing. Yeah, that was good. Uh, that is uh, TWIV 911. There, there is no emergency here. There's just uh, science. Uh, you can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash twiv. You can send us a question or a comment or a pic or a haiku if you'd like one of, uh, what's her name? I have her, her letter right here, Jane, Pamela Jane. If you'd like one of Pamela Jane's uh, children's books, write, write some kind of a, a poem. Uh, and if you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Brianne Barker is at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. You have to say it slowly, like <laughs> Bam Lanivimab. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, it was great to <laughs> no, be no, no. here. <laughs> Rich Condit's an emeritus professor at University of Florida, Gainesville. He's currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>